Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And uh, let's see, we may have to put that in the One to three slides, so naturally I have about six. Here, can you go to the table? Okay. okay, so uh, let me just say uh, uh, a few brief remarks about the values and uh, where, uh, where they live in the So if you were at the Detroit Auto Show this year, you would be surprised to see the, the number of electric vehicles. So this is a snapshot of vehicles that are not concept vehicles, but the technical production. That's the big difference. And so uh, you might ask, well, what has happened in the last few years? Take us from uh, where we were to where we are today. And this includes the vehicles ranging from $100,000 plus electric sports cars down to a $16,000 electric, uh, electric vehicle for our use. And so, uh, this one way to look at this is at the different levels of electrification. And this is where the materials issues and battery technology really tie in. It says we progress from internal combustion engine. Uh, the next level is the hybrid electric vehicle, and you all know examples of these. And uh, that, was that has been enabled by battery technology that is now uh, perhaps uh, 15, years old, uh, 15 uh, years old. And then today, uh, what we're seeing is plug-in hybrid vehicles. And so these have a large proportion of batteries. And for a number of technical reasons, these are now technically feasible, I think, in almost every respect. We just wish they were a little bit cheaper. So, for example, a 40 mile plug in hybrid at 50 cents a watt hour requires a battery that costs about $8,000 today. Uh, so, if we continue, uh, so the plug in hybrid is a great uh, near term solution. And all electric vehicles, there's new terminology in town, by the way, we used to just call them EVs, but there are so many different types of uh, uh, hybrid, and, uh, hybrid vehicles today, we call them X EVs in general. And there's a new terminology, BEV. So when you hear someone refer to a BEV as a battery electric vehicle, that's an electric vehicle, an all electric vehicle. And so if we really look at uh, what's necessary based on today's battery technology to enable a uh, broad use, 3,000 pound, 200 mile range uh, all electric vehicle today, and uh, today's battery metrics, uh, that's a battery about, uh, let's say, uh, 1,500 pounds, about $40,000 and about the filled in backseat and your trunk. And so that's where the materials challenges still lie. And to, to get the cost down, to get the energy density up, to get the life to the way there are many materials kind of challenges that remain. Now, uh, in a surprising new area for me at least, uh, even lithium rechargeable batteries have started to find a role in stabilizing the grid. And I think increasingly people realize that there are many different points of storage in which you can improve the efficiency of electric grid, and uh, many recognize that renewable energy being intermittent will require storage. Okay. And so what I wanted to show you is that uh, this chart is uh, it's impossible to read from the back, but the, the, the underlying uh, chart is from the Energy Storage Association. And it shows you the duration or power uh, and the storage and the horizontal axis is the total power required for a lot of different grid applications. What I've put on there are the electric vehicle applications. And so, a simple way to think of this from an engineering metric perspective is the ratio of watts in terms of power to watt hours in terms of storage. Okay. The highest power uh, HEV batteries, this ratio is over 200. Uh, for renewable energy, this ratio, uh, those of I've spoken to, I think is about uh, one quarter. So, it spans a range of about a factor of a thousand. Watts, watt hours. And so, but when we map the actual values of the grid needs, we actually choose very close correspondence. So, uh, there, I'll show you just one example of this, this uh, of uh, where some sort of surprising application. This is, I would refer to as the HEV battery of the grid. Okay. It's a battery that is used for an application called frequency regulation uh, to buffer short term uh, high power spikes in, in the uh, in for the electricity su supply. And so uh, this is uh, two, it's literally a 53-foot uh, track trailer, uh, two megawatts, half a megawatt hour. Uh, it turns out that the power energy ratio is almost identical to that of the PHEV. Uh, this uses 82,000 uh, power to the batteries. 
the thing that is. And the only reason that the, uh, the customer uses this is because it saves them money. But in the process, of course, it, it improves efficiency and lowers the greenhouse gas output. So this is an example, very, I think an early example of where storage will continue to play a role. And uh, I think that uh, especially for the longer duration of storage, uh, that's where there are a great many uh, opportunities to develop new materials in chemistry. Thank you. Great. Modules have a long lifetime, as you just mentioned that. 
In fact, the first solar cell uh, developed at Bell Labs in 1954 has been tested and it's still operating just fine over 50 years. PV mod uh, module materials can be recycled, the silicon, the aluminum, the glass, other materials are very available for recycling at the end of use. Land area is very small. Uh, if you have 15% solar cells, you just need an area within the United States of 200 by 200 square miles that would supply all the energy needs for the United States. Now, you wouldn't necessarily do that, but you could spread that out. So it's a, it is very efficient from a plant standpoint. The power output can be tailored to match requirements, whether it's a few hundred watts for monitoring devices to two gigawatts. Uh, there was an announcement uh, a few months ago that uh, in China, uh, it's actually in Mongolia, first of all, will be putting in a two gigawatt facility uh, in uh, China. That's uh, two nuclear power plants. And it can be easily installed. A little perspective on where the prices are. One of the uh, issues with solar uh, photovoltaic right now is the prices is a bit too high for, uh, from the standpoint of comparing to traditional power sources. This is a chart showing the trend, and you can see that in 2005, uh, the prices were around $3, $4 a, a, uh, a watt. This is uh, for energy produced. In 2009, it's projected to be $2 to uh, around $2 a watt, depending on whether it's crystalline or thin film. The goal really is to be at a dollar a watt. Uh, once a dollar a watt is achieved, then the price of electricity produced by solar energy will be equivalent to that of the grid, around nine cents. Uh, last graph, uh, just showing where PV is going. The prices of PV will continue to go down through increased uh, manufacturing efficiency and decreased use of silicon and other uh, items that will decrease the cost. So those trends, depending on the type of PV, will continue to go down. The cost of uh, U.S. electricity generated by traditional sources will increase, whether it's 4% or 5% or 6%, but it will increase over time. And that crossover point is on the order of 200 uh, 2016. Uh, there's many other different types of projects, but generally around five, six years out, you're going to reach that crossover point between the cost of PV, generated electricity, and traditional power sources. And then you'll see the demand as well as the supply to skyrocket. Uh, also, to do this, there's no technical breakthroughs that are needed. It's uh, just a lot of hard work. Uh, Last uh, slide, basically a vision, my vision, maybe be a little bit provocative. Uh, by 2050, renewable energy sources provide 50% of the electric power needed by the world with a significant contribution from photovoltaics. And I'd like to end with a quote uh, from Thomas Edison. I would put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. Thank you. Okay, uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank the organizers for allowing me to come and talk about a subject I have a great deal of passion for, and that's the role of nuclear energy as a bridge technology to uh, future future energy needs. And I also want to thank Dr. Uh, Wadsworth and Dr. Coonan for their provocative uh, talks this morning. And if I could work the advancer here, maybe the battery for that. It's always a battery. It, it, um. Okay. And now we don't have a slideshow. All right, well, I can, I can start and, and, and talk from, from memory and, and the heart, I guess. And, and what, one of the things that you, uh, you'll find is it was set up uh, by Dr. Coonan, and that uh, in the United States today, virtually uh, all of our, we've got a battery, I can look at the battery. Um, virtually all of our greenhouse gas-free power is provided by nuclear power. It's 20% of our, our grid 
uh, it's 20% of our baseline grid supply and it's 80% of the uh, carbon free energy. So first of all, I've, I've got a disclaimer here that uh, these views are, are my views and my views only don't represent the U.S. Department of Energy or my employer. Um, but again, we've seen this in, in a lot of different ways today and you'll see it more and more as the dialogue unfolds. In the U.S. we are among the highest electricity uh, consumers in, in terms of CO2 emissions. What you may not be able to see from this, this chart on the bottom though is that when renewables are a part of that, that energy supply, then the, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, go down greatly. And you can see here uh, countries like France that, that get you know, virtually uh, all of their electrical power from, from uh, nuclear, 80 to 90 percent at the uh, last data that I've seen. Their, their CO2 emissions are greatly reduced. What that leads to is nuclear power is becoming more and more of a worldwide uh, source of, of energy. And as we've talked about you know, here, energy is a, an indicator of GDP and cheap, reliable energy is required for economic development. Across the world, there are now 436 operating reactors. And in the United States here, where the industry has been relatively stagnant for the last two and a half, or about three decades, there are over 100 operating reactors. Um, the numbers of, of growth around the world are, are staggering. And uh, within the U.S., there are 13 to 17 applications that are under review by the NRC, including some several active uh, construction projects. Uh, in the southeast primarily. Um, but across the world, particularly in developing countries, as you can see in the bottom of China and, and India, as was mentioned earlier, the, the, the role of nuclear has been embraced and uh, the, uh, the industry is growing very rapidly. The, uh, what I like to, to say, just to, to uh, get the dialogue started here, is nuclear is, is CO2 free and energy independent power. And if I could be further provocative, I'll also tell you that it's renewable. Um, people don't like to see, to think about uh, breeder reactor cycles, breeder burner reactor cycles, but when I talk about nuclear energy, I, I truly refer to it as a cradle-to-cradle -cradle technology because with a breeder reactor cycle, not only can you use it, but you can create more. So it's uh, get your heads around that cradle-to-cradle uh, that -cradle technology. The issue is you'll see uh, this afternoon, and this is a shameless plug for some of my colleagues who have put together a wonderful symposium on material solutions for the nuclear renaissance. The, the thing that you'll see over the next couple of days is that materials advances are, are paramount to achieving not only increased production from our current reactor fleet going to cycles like deep burn, dealing with nuclear waste, but they're also critical towards the advancement of uh, fission technology through Gen 3, Gen 3 Plus, and Gen 4 reactor systems, but also fusion technology, which is, I think, we, we have all agreed to. In, in my 30-year career, it's been 50 years out for 30 years, and hopefully it will be uh, 50 years out for another 30 years, but the, the issues associated with bringing fusion to reality rest largely on the materials and the material solutions that we can come up with for containing the plasma operating those systems. So with that, thank you. But uh, other mineral forms of lithium are more expensive to refine, but it's not that much more expensive to refine. And in fact, right now, uh, today, is a glut of lithium. Economy is kind of actually closing today. So, uh, so when you look at that, uh, and also the fact that uh, what they call the known reserves, and where it's known reserves, and so this, uh, and there hasn't been a need for more than that. And so uh, there may well be other sources of it. Another point, so uh, but again, is that I don't think that this is going to be an issue for quite some time. Uh, another point is the fact that unlike uh, fossil fuels, when you use it's, uh, it doesn't go on its own. If you can recycle it, it will be recycled. And so it will certainly be a value added material. Those in the business of building batteries will want to keep a close eye on supply and cost. So there will certainly be those issues. But in terms of a supply constraint, a restriction, 
the numbers that I've seen and, uh, uh, from the industry, and I believe also from the U.S. Geological Survey, suggests that this will not be an issue for at least a couple of decades, if it ever becomes one. And also, you know, the way that the battery technology has progressed, uh, uh, it would probably not uh, be a wise bet today to say that 30 years from now we'll still be using the base battery. So for those reasons, I think that we're in good shape, and that's probably not the main thing we should uh, worry about today. Very good. All right, questions out here? And please wait for the mic. On that same subject, um, lithium is one issue, but uh, I'll be talking uh, tomorrow about another supply side issue on the rare earth um, components, which go into a lot of batteries and wind and uh, another, a bunch of green technologies, including a tremendous amount of de defense applications. And today, uh, for all practical purposes, one country provides between 90 and 99 percent of the entire lanthanide series globally. And the, uh, their position is almost uh, impossible to challenge from a capital standpoint in the private sector. That's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and by 2015, if you're successful in solar and you're successful at the Prius and the Volt and all these other uh, non-emission uh, automobiles, et cetera, um, it, it, there's actually, it's impossible to proceed down that path because China looks like they'll consume up to probably 100% of their internal production by 2015. So by 2015, there'll be in fact no lanthanides available outside of China. And uh, this is a, a serious financial and structural problem to overcome. So, if I can respond. So, the, the, the direction of battery chemistry, because we need to drive down costs, uh, the direction of uh, battery chemistry it has been towards more abundant, low cost materials. So, just within the, the lithium uh, battery family, for example, so in addition to lithium, what you need is a transition metal. Okay? And cobalt has been a dominant transition metal for the past 15 years. And that, that clearly is an issue, but the new generation of lithium batteries uses iron and manganese. And so there are, except for uh, trace tokens, there are substantial amounts of rare earths that are used today. And we need to continue moving in that direction to, to get the cost down even further. But I don't think that is for the lithium battery producers. Like said, they're much more concerned about cobalt than they are about the earths. Thank you. My question is to Greg. Uh, you talked about solar energy. What about the uh, material challenges in direct solar thermal or solar concentrations for processing? Those are also very good sources. I couldn't cover everything in just a few slides, but I'm an advocate of uh, using tapping into the sun's energy. So thermal, solar, through direct radiation of heating hot water and concentrating the sun rays for photovoltaics, those are also excellent sources. Mark Smith, Sandy National Labs. A couple quick questions, Greg. One, uh, I haven't heard many people comment on another potential advantage of photovoltaics, which is decentralization. We have huge losses in transmitting electrical power from central sources. If you could comment briefly on that. And then the other one is related to, obviously, the sun doesn't shine at night, so you've got all the reserve capacity, so you gain on one hand, lose on the other. Could you comment on that balance? Sure. Uh, in terms of a smart grid, I think a smart grid will actually help all energy sources, traditional and non- uh, and renewable sources, so that would help to <laughs> shine in the uh, early morning or noon at uh, uh, New York. There's still a few hours, three hours or so of sunlight the West Coast, so I think having smart grid to help transfer power over some distances, certainly not East Coast to West Coast, would be an advantage. Uh, your second, your first question was uh, transmission. I'm not an expert on electrical transmission losses, but I think 500 or maybe uh, about down you have kind of 500 or 1,000 miles you can transfer uh, electrical power that's relatively efficient without too many losses. That, Somebody else might have to comment on that. But it can, one advantage of, of solar is that it can be off grid and it can be uh, localized uh, and tailored to the application or the needs. Look at the 
question of nuclear power, after Three Mile Island construction stopped for political reasons, the issue of waste disposal is, has a significant political component, not just a technical component. Are you seeing a shift in the political will to build nuclear power plants? Oh, oh absolutely. Um, you know, there, there's little doubt, and there's, as I said in my uh, opening comments, there's you know, 15 to 20 applications or letters of intent that have been filed with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, already for reactors here in the, in the United States. Um, the, you know, the back end dealing with, and, and if you come to some of the some talks this afternoon, I'll get into a lot of detail on this. The back end of dealing with the, the waste issue is a, a long term, long term issue for nuclear power. You know, spent nuclear fuel is very stable and is able to be stored. Um, dry at the reactor sites for, for periods of, of hundreds of years. But at some point, you know, you need to deal with the, the long-lived radionuclides. And uh, fortunately, there's been a, a, an active program led by the, the US DOE called the Advanced Fuel Cycle Initiative, now called Fuel Cycle Research and Development, that is looking at the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle and looking at advanced, what I'll call more proliferation uh, resistant uh, recycling technologies where you, you don't separate pure plutonium as part of the process and if you do you have the adequate materials control and accountability on that. So that there really is a and the, the public opinion surveys um, are you know greatly in favor they're leaning more and more towards nuclear power as a CO2 uh, free power. So there there is a there is a sentiment there that's pushing it forward. Uh, again it's a matter of, of staying the course. Oh, uh, Joy Forsmark uh, from Ford Motor Company. Um, I have kind of a, a industrially uh, centric uh, question. Um, I work in a fairly long lead time industry. Um, so the question of uh, batteries um, becomes really important um, in terms of commonization um, and in terms of kind of a stopping point. I guess I'm throwing this out to all of you. A stopping point at some point where you You've got to get going on the industrial application. Um, how do you, as researchers, incorporate things that are changing rapidly into a more industrial way of looking at uh, things where we might have a three-year lead time where we got to set it in stone and then we got to move forward? How are, how are you going to address that? Okay. So, yes, the qualification of time cycle for our motor is about two years, as you know, for batteries. And so, uh, so you better get started testing early. And so you, you, you get that just by starting testing before anybody else does. But uh, so I think over the last few years, it's been a little bit easier. There wasn't any incumbent technology for PhDs. And so as long as you're going to be the first technology in, well, uh, uh, over time, it'll get more difficult because you have, uh, there's more resistance displacing so uh, this is, uh, for researchers, that is a major issue. You know, how do you get from laboratory to commercialization? And uh, there is it's, it's too much to be said about that <laughs> to really answer it in a short period of time here. But this is what people refer to the valley of death, uh, which has, has been crossed. And so I think you're seeing more and more examples of how that can happen on the fastest side of time. As uh, another secretary referred to comparing in, energy and the uh, and IT or uh, other uh, information-based technologies. So, yep, so let me, I'll stop. <laughs> I, I think it also gets into the role of, of public policy. My microphone, okay. Uh, you know, particularly on the nuclear side, you know, there, there are other forces at play that make it much more difficult in certain cases to implement technology innovations, notably a licensing activity. So I, I think it's the, uh, the administration is trying to do with this innovative approach to, to energy development, you need to get into this public partner, a uh, public-private partnership because of, you know for certain advances it is very it is very costly and it's tough for a, a private company or in, in the case of nuclear or private utility to bear the, the, the risk and the cost associated with developing the next generation 
of, of the technology. And that's one of the reasons that you'll see uh, fusion programs are not being led by the private industry. They're being led by a governmental organization because the risk is, the risk is just too high. Okay. Uh, I used to kind of use an 80 20 percent rule as long as what you have meets about 80 percent of the requirements both from the producer standpoint and the consumer, that's probably good enough to go ahead. Uh, as a researcher, or someone who's involved in research for many years, I know that you want to keep doing more work and more work and more work to make it perfect. But the world isn't like that. The world has to move on. So I'd say as long as it meets your minimum requirements and the economics are there and no other major issues, just go with that, implement it, and then over time you'll develop things that are better. You know, I think the, the, the chart that, that Dr. Coonan showed, the analogy to uh, advances in personal personal electronics is, is exactly what we need to do. Energy moves very slowly. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's part of the, the economics that needs to be looked at and overcome so that energy energy innovation can move at a more rapid pace. And, and you know, I've seen this in, in my lifetime. You know, what, what happened after the energy crisis of the the early 70s when the, 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 the government was looking at it very uh, very heavily and very dramatically. Well, the, the price stabilized, the price came down, so what happened? Those research funds and that, that, that drive for innovation got placed in, in something else. So it's a matter of, of having that balanced portfolio and keeping that portfolio funded at a level where you can actually continue to do the R&D necessary to bring the next generation to the market. Along those same lines, uh, one of the great needs that we have in materials for energy is high temperature corrosion resistant materials, conventional kinds of things. Yet funding in this nation has been moving from those kinds of materials researchers to more esoteric things, specifically a lot of work on nanomaterials. I wonder if you could comment on the impact of that shift in funding on the potential for future high temperature corrosion resistant materials. Question for the well, I don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm the expert, Mac, but we call high temperature corrosion resistant materials ceramics. Um, as, a, as a past president of the Ceramic Society, I'm, I'm, I'm forced to make that plug, but I, but I think you're right. You know, it's one of these things where the, you know, the funding tends to follow, and Dr. Coonan said it, making intelligent policy. And, you know, we all hear, we all hear buzzwords like nanotechnology, and we see a lot of funding, and I talk to, to our delegation, that, that resonates with them, because they, they think it's new and they think it's exciting. And when I point out to them that, you know, if it wasn't for nanotechnology, you know, we wouldn't have uh, we wouldn't have half the things we're dealing with, and George Eastman wouldn't have made a lot of money on on Kodak uh, film and emulsion. So, it, it is a matter of informing public policy, and I think that's a role that, that all of us in this room have in, in being able to sustain that. And it, it it's this use inspired as, as we heard yesterday in the Rustum Roy lecture by by Chuck Best. This use inspired R and D is really what, what needs to, to drive things, moving out of the, the Edisonian quadrant and the uh, past year's quadrant into that use-inspired R&D. And I think it, you know, the more we can do that, the more we in this room can, can work with our legislators and make sure they understand that, then I think that we'll be better off. I, I have a quick question for you. There, there's been a, um, a lot of interest of late in smaller right-sized reactors with the notion of putting them on everything from military bases, some remote locations, some where you can bring the whole small reactor back and just re retrofit it with new fuel and then take it back out. Any comments on whether or not you think that really has legs? Oh, I think there's there's little question that, that that has legs and a lot of opportunities. And if you come to my talk this afternoon again, I hate to keep plugging this. Uh, but I'm going I'm to show the uses for these small and medium-sized reactors uh, for things like load following and process heat and, and things that can address some of the, uh, the problems we have with the grid and the problems we have with renewables' ability to provide.
provide the constant energy we need. But it, you use the, I use the analogy of a, a nuclear fuel aircraft carrier. It has fueled once for 30 years, and it operates for 30 years before coming back in and being refueled. And the refueling process is typically, because there's a desire to turn those around, is typically a modular replacement of almost the entire primary reactor system. So I think if we continue to make those advances, and, and if there, there's a, an awful lot, and I don't want to get into a lot of public policy of, of, uh, of weapons nations being able to supply reactors and, and fuel take back and leasing programs for, for uh, emerging economies to do that. So uh, I think that's a portion of the, the Bush administration's ill-fated GNM process that still has, still has legs and is still moving forward. Uh, on exactly that topic, uh, nobody talks about thorium as, uh, as a reactor fuel, and for a lot of you, you might be surprised, but in 1958 to 1962, the U.S. Army operated a 50 megawatt thorium reactor that you could pull around with a tractor trailer. Um, so this has been done in the, uh, the lifter technology, which would be a, a liquid fluorine thorium reactor. Um, also, it's extremely safe. It's almost proliferation proof. You know, it's pretty close. And the actinides uh, are, are a fraction of the existing technology. So uh, I think it would make sense to talk more about that because um, it's certainly safer, its costs are lower, and the mobility and the containerized uh, 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 potential for thorium reactors is, is very real and it's been proven. And, and that is very much on the, on the table right now and being talked about within the, the confines of the U.S. Department of Energy. And it is a, it is a technology that is, is being looked at. The Indians, you know, have, have decided on a thorium-based fuel cycle. They made that decision several decades ago and they, they've stuck with it. So it is a technology that is being looked at. Uh, but, you know, I, I like to, to say that and I, I see this a lot in, in my business with the DOE dealing with the environmental management legacy that every alternative always looks better than the baseline technology until you until you investigate it to the same point as the baseline technology and then there, there are always are these puts and takes that one has to consider. So over here. Uh, coming back to the uh, energy storage, can you uh, collectively comment on the scale of energy storage that you think is going to happen in the future, um, are, are the, uh, the BEVs, are they going to be a major component of energy storage? Are, is energy storage also going to be at the home? And uh, what then are, is the fraction of energy storage in large, I don't know what you call, battery farms? So we have these kind of three or four different levels. Um, how, 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 what are the relative proportions of those as we move forward? And what are kind of the decision frameworks that we use uh, to decide what is the best portfolio of uh, energy storage levels that we use, independent of perhaps the technology, the battery technology for the moment. I, I think that's a hotly debated topic right now. So this topic, the work falls under the umbrella of uh, so massive energy storage, which means it collectively huge amount of uh, megawatt hours. Uh, it could be relatively centralized or as uh, companies like uh, AES are promoting, they, they would like to have it distributed. Maybe it's a storage station on a street corner. And so uh, I, I don't think there's yet a, a an answer to that. And so the largest lithium ion uh, installation that's being worked on right now is 32 megawatt hours, for example. And uh, there are some very large lead acid installations in the place. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think that there'll be. Uh, there, there will be a lot of adaptation where it's relatively distributed. And in fact, uh, there is there's some interesting use models. And the web application is probably the most demanding application for a battery. And it has to be mobile. It has to be uh, large temperature swing, a street, and large temperature swings at a very long life. At the end of a useful life of a car battery, it still might be very good battery. Not given the purpose of the stationary storage. And so that might lend itself to it also one localized distributed storage. Yeah, I'd like to count just in general about energy storage. I think all forms of energy, particularly renewable energy, such as wind, photovoltaic, can benefit from energy storage. And when it's not, uh, when the wind's blowing, you can store that excess energy. When it's not, you have batteries. Same way with sunlight. So I think that having efficient batteries
batteries at all scales, whether they're small batteries uh, monitoring the stream levels or something like this, which is powered by photovoltaic systems, or uh, large energy storage uh, that uh, takes some of the excess storage of electrical energy from a grid. Uh, I think this is definitely needed. It might be helpful to try some numbers on cost per watt hour for storage. So, uh, so pump time is about 10 cents a watt hour and the rest of the somewhere similar to that. So, uh, sodium sulfur, 30-year-old uh, technology, uh, one Japanese company that uh, stuck with it the most and that has a, a significant market. But that's about 30 cents a watt hour. And so that's what, uh, there's, there's a gap there. And, but uh, if you look at the, how fast the cost curve is coming down for automotive batteries, uh, a year or two ago, it was a dollar a watt hour. Now, uh, 30 to 50 cents is uh, uh, widely discussed as commercially feasible, and the DOE is pushing hard to get that down to about 15 cents. And so, surprisingly, the cost of storage for the mobile transportation is starting to look like it may eventually converge with large scale stationary storage. And that is what may enable more distributed storage. It, I think it would be difficult to have high distributed storage of. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're out of time. We hope that this has been a very informative and enlightening session for the last couple of hours for, for many of you. There are many serious challenges facing the materials community as we tackle the energy problems that sit before us. And so, with that, if you could please thank me again and thank you, our, uh, let me thank our panelists and our next speakers.